of all of our praise. Amen? Amen. Jesus, we love you and we exalt you in your in the name that is above every name. Before we get into God's word today and continue in our series, uh, I want to read out of Isaiah. And I was listening to a, a preacher that I like and respect, and he had his wife with them, him up on stage. And uh, both of them were doing some ministry together. And uh, they started to quote out of Isaiah, and it so touched me that I wanted to relay it to you before we look at the book of Romans together. And as I was reading or hearing them read this text, some of this text, I'm not going to read the whole thing that they did, then I really sensed in my spirit uh, that, that there's going to be a word for someone here in the area of being weary and waiting. And you've been waiting for something. Uh, it, it could be relating to something physical. And this is what the Holy Spirit prompts and impresses upon us through his word. And so I'm going to read this, and I just want you to be open to that. And if this is you, uh, know that God is active in your life. He is at work, and he has a word for you, and he wants to bring comfort to you. You're weary in waiting for something. Here's what it says. Isaiah 40, verse 28, have you not known... Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Now, as I've read those verses through the years, I know that for me, it's like, wow, I'm young. It applies to me, right? Even youth. I don't know if I consider myself a youth anymore. But what we want to do with that context, though, is, is get the point of what the prophet Isaiah is saying, and that God is God, and he's on the throne. If you read before that, he is the one who is sovereign over all providentially involved in all of our lives down to every detail. So sometimes we're going to get to that place where we're going to be weary and we feel like we cannot go on. We can't take another step. You can't take another breath. So whatever that is, you're weary in the wait. God speaking to you specifically. We're going to pray for our Kenya project. Uh, Lynn, Becky, and Judy are in Kenya and tomorrow, they're having hundreds of kids that they're going to feed. At the same time, they're going to give the gospel, and they're going to give Jesus to them so that they would be born again if they don't know Jesus. So we're going to pray right now uh, for the Kenya Project, for these dear ladies that are over there right now pre preparing for tomorrow. Can we do that together? Yeah. Father, we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Uh, and in your name, Jesus, is mighty. It's above every name. There is no other name. There is no other God. You're, you are God. You are Jesus. You died on the cross for our sins and rose again from the dead. You ascended into heaven, and then you sent your Holy Spirit to indwell all of us, not just in this room, but those watching online and across the world, those who call on your name. So we call on your name on behalf of these dear ladies that are over there amongst a, a team of people that are going to feed many, many children tomorrow. Holy Spirit, would you move even now ahead then would you open eyes and touch little hearts, and may they know that you, Jesus, are very real, that you're the one that saves the soul, that you're the one that is ever-present. You said you would never leave us nor forsake us. And so blessings on the Kenya Project tomorrow, Lord. Anoint them. Give them unction. Give them power. May they see you descend upon them in mighty works, Lord. Mighty works. We ask for the devil to be pushed back, all his wily ways, his schemes, his devices. We pray, Lord, that we would hear back that there was tremendous victory, that many, many people were touched, and you used uh, our, our ladies to do that and others. We just thank you, Lord, that we don't have to be weary in the wait. Who is that that's sitting here or watching online, and they feel like they, they just can't go another step? Please minister to them right now. Help them to know that you are over their life, in their life, around their life, that you are for them, not against them. May they mount up with wings as eagles. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Let's take our Bibles together. We're going to talk about working out, working out. Working out is the thing. There we go. Speak for yourself, man. (laughs) Working out. You hear many, if not most, Americans talking about taking care of themselves. They're jogging, they're running, they're climbing, they're kayaking, they're walking, they're biking, they're lifting. People in our culture are into working out. There's a movement that's going on. There are workout classes for everyone at every age. You'll see an image here on here. It doesn't matter if you're 10 years old or if you're 100 years old. There's a workout space for you at every level. Working out for all sorts of reasons, to lose weight, to gain muscle, to increase stamina, or maybe to meet someone. I know for me, when I was working out just three years ago, and it's such a reflection on my mind, I was in cardiac rehab having had a heart attack, and so I needed to go through rehab. And so I was, I was really literally in the middle of everyone who is far older than me. And so I had been uh, in the gym world for a long, long time, and a cardiac rehab nurse said, hey, do you want to lift weights with us? And I was like, yeah, I'll lift weights with you. And, and so we went into the gym, and she handed me a couple of weights. And... Uh, so I'm holding on to these, and I'm, I'm with Margaret to my right, and, and so I'm like, what happened to me, Lord? You know, and I'm doing this with them, and we're all having a good time, and there's music playing. Working out. If you go back many, many years, which was part of my, my world, uh, one of the original fitness centers was called Gold's Gym. Gold's Gym originated in the 70s out in Santa Monica, California. If you went out to the pier out there, you would see, like, the bodybuilding mecca. And from there, there's been this incredible movement, and now it's just amazing to see all of the different facilities and different places that you can work out and take care of yourself and get healthier and all of that. Well, in Paul's day, working out and experiencing exercise was a big deal. I'm going to show you some verses here, and, and then we'll get to the book of Romans. Paul said in 1 Corinthians, I don't want to block you, every athlete. Now, we're coming up to the Olympic Games, right? Do they start this week, the Olympics? Nobody cares, right? (laughs) I'm pretty sure they start in Paris uh, coming up. But every athlete, and and the reason why I say that is the Isthmian Games were part of the Corinthian culture, and also the Olympic Games. This is where it originated. So in the mind of the Apostle Paul and the churches in Corinth and around that way, they would understand exercise and training and working out. They would get it. Every athlete, what? Exercises. Now, here's the comparison. They exercise self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. A little bit lower there, 1 Timothy 4, 6, Paul says, if you put these things, this is talking about pastoral, if you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus being trained. That's gymnazo. We looked at that word, gymnazo. Uh, there were gyms in that day, like there's gyms today, Gold's Gym and Fitness Centers and LA this, that, and the era. They, they had it in that day. It was just very relevant to their culture as it is to our culture today. But he's using that word again, being trained in the words of faith and of good doctrine that you have followed. Another slide, please. Notice. First, or 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is breathed out, theonustos, God's breath. We looked at that in our first message breathed out by God, and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction. For what? For training. Now, the implication here is it's going to take intentional effort. It's going to take work. It's going to be work. The word of God is work. You know, uh, all of the things that we're looking at is training, and training is not easy. To be a righteous person will not be easy. Would you agree? You're going to have to train. You're going to have to get to the gym. You're going to have to put some effort into being a godly woman or a godly man. Titus said this in 2.12, training. Now, this is talking about the incarnation. This is before that. It's Jesus coming, manifest in the flesh, training us. So when Jesus came, he then is training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in his present age. The point I'm trying to make is that in the mind of the Apostle Paul and in that culture, they understood training, exercise, or working out. It's part of their culture. Now, we're in the middle of a four-part series that I've titled Working Your Core, Working Your Core. 
Remember the core is, right? It's the, the front. It, it's, your, it's your abs. It, it would be your back. It would be your gluteus maximus. It would be your, your thighs. That's your core. And that part of your, your body needs to be as healthy and strong as you can. If not, then it affects your whole body. Your whole life will be affected. Well, in Christianity, in our faith, there are core beliefs, core practices that we all need to be engaged in. We need to be exercising. We need to be training. We need to be doing this thing. And so we've already looked at, first of all, reading the Bible. Reading the Bible. What does this book say about itself? And we looked at this. Uh, what, what is your view towards this book? Uh, from the first word in Genesis to the last word in Revelation, I believe that this book is perfect. I believe there's no error. I believe that it's inerrant. I believe that it's infallible, which means it's believable. I need this book. This book is my survival. That's how much I need this book. Reading it is not easy. Studying it, that much harder. But we need to do that. We need to exercise in that. For my wife and I, we're using a Bible app. Are you familiar with Bible apps, right? You can pull those up and it helps, right? And you can go through Scripture. We're going through Proverbs together, my wife and I. I think we're in chapter 13 now. Wonderful. There's some ways that you can do this that's helpful. I remember when I was in between semesters, I went to Liberty Baptist College. This is back, way back. Uh, it's called Liberty University now, but uh, way back. I was in between semesters, and I came back to New England. A friend of mine, my college roommate, was from Connecticut, and so I came up to his church. Uh, it was called Landmark Baptist Church, and I went in to talk with the pastor at the time, and I was just a new believer. And, uh, and I had seen John MacArthur at college. He came to Liberty Falwell, and he uh, connected. And so I sat underneath John MacArthur um, for a Sunday service, and I was just I was kind of in awe of the Word of God as John MacArthur brought it. So when I went to the pastor up here, he had this whole bookshelf full of John MacArthur and his New Testament, every cassette tape. Does everybody remember what a cassette tape is? Some of the young people are just, ah, I don't know what that is. But anyway, so I went through the whole New Testament with John MacArthur, and, and that, for me, uh, would be the beginning and, and the, the love for the Word of God. Do you love God's Word? Do you know that you need it? Do you read it? Do you study it? Do you obey it? Here's a little phrase that I hope that you'll remember. It's not hard to remember. You do what you desire. That's, I don't know if that's original or not, but I, I try it. Everything you do in life, you do it because you desire. You would not do something if you didn't desire it. You would probably be a fruitcake or a nutcase or some kind of, you would, there would be something wrong with you mentally. Seriously, I'm not trying to be funny. Because you are made. This is what Jonathan Edwards said. He said that you, you desire, your desires are moving out in front of you. That could be righteous desire or unrighteous desire, but whatever it is, whatever you desire, you will do. And so the word of God, do you desire it? Because if you're not reading it and studying it, then you probably don't desire it as much as you should. So we looked at that. Two, we looked at worshiping. Worshiping, And what I found helpful here, and you'll see an image here. Can we bring up the image? It's a TV show many years ago. Do you remember who this was? Right? It was a home improvement TV show, and it was just, it was great. It was a great show. Um, but he would peek over the fence, right, and kind of talk to, um, I don't remember his name now, Tim, Tim the Tool Man. I know that much. And so what I've done is I've looked over the fence. This is what I started to do early. In other words, I didn't want to stay in the Baptist world. Remember, Liberty Baptist College, that was my world. And then Landmark Baptist Church was my world. Uh, the pastor started looking over the fence into the charismatic world and the Pentecostal world. Uh, to some people, you don't do that. To some people, you isolate yourself so far and cut yourself so far off that it's just you don't go to that tribe. But I started to do this early on because I found my worship Something was wrong. Something was wrong. It wasn't going far enough. And so I looked over the fence into uh, the life of the Pentecostals and Charismatics because I found them to be at the beginning of my Christianity a little strange. <laughs> and I judged them. I'm not saying that was a righteous thing. It was an unrighteous thing. They had something I didn't have. It was expression. 
It was the presence of Almighty God. It's not just singing a song to God or about God. It was singing now to God, kind of in a personal way. There's a difference there. Now, these are hard. Reading the Word of God and worshiping are not easy exercises. Uh, when I was uh, younger, much younger, and training very hard and exercising very hard, uh, I didn't like to stretch. They always used to say, you got to stretch, you got to stretch, you got to stretch. And so I never stretched. I hated stretching, even to this day. You know, it's kind of like, oh, I hate this, I hate this. I mean, I'm not enjoying it. You know, I'm just like going down to your toes. You know, you feel it in the, in the hamstrings. But when you read the word of God, it's going to stretch you. If you're going to worship the way that God has called you to worship, it's going to stretch you. you got to do your stretching. It's all part of it. Take your Bibles and go to Romans chapter 12. I want to look at the third core, and that's praying. Praying, not just reading the Bible, not just worshiping, but praying. Romans chapter 12, verses 9 down to verse 21. Now, this is a wonderful book. Uh, I'm excited about Romans. In fact, every year we go through a book of the Bible. We just finished Nehemiah. I started that with you in January. The year before that, when I first got here, uh, we went through the book of James together, verse by verse. So what we're going to do in January is go through the book of Romans together. I'm fired up about that. Romans is an amazing letter. Um, but for now, we're just going to do just a little bit of a a taste of Romans in chapter 12, 9 to 21. I'm already gearing up for that uh, series that we'll do in January through this wonderful letter that the Apostle Paul wrote. I'm excited to, to, to mine it. I've already been in it many, many times in 30 years, but I, I did, you get something new every time. And so that's what we're going to do together come, in, come January. So are you in Romans chapter 12, 9 to 21? Are you there? There's a little phrase in verse 12. I'll start there with you. A little phrase. Look at verse 12, chapter 12 of Romans. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. And then what's the next phrase? I like that version. My ESV is saying be constant in prayer. Do some versions say be faithful? Do you have that one? Good. Const I'm going to use the word constant. Uh, I'm staying with the ESV version. Nothing wrong with those other versions that you were reading from. Verse 12, constant in prayer. What does it mean to be constant? Well, I have a, a definition here. What does it mean to be constant? Occurring continuously over a period of time. Paul's saying uh, when it comes to praying, not just praying, by the way, it'll be reading. It's all connected. Because when he's talking about praying constantly, he's also covering all of these other things that we're going to look at. And so there, there needs to be a continuous occurrence of this particular thing in our life, and that would be praying. Constant in prayer. Constant in prayer. Now, let me ask a question. What is the evidence that your workouts are making a difference, like physical workouts? What's the evidence? What would you say? You talk to me. Stamina, Stamina gets better. What else? Strength, Strength increase. Weight, weight loss. Yeah, all of these things are going to be results. Now, what's the results of us exercising the cores of Christianity? Well, we're going to see some of those in this text. In other words, if, that, if you're doing this, if you're training yourself, uh, you're going to experience this, and you're going to be healthier and stronger in your Christian life. Very important. Very important. I'm going to use another word, not just constant, but constancy. Con you're not going to see it on the screen. Constancy, dedicated, steadfast, you're tenacious, you're determined, and again, whoever had that, that version that said faithful in prayer, uh, that's the idea. Are we faithful? Are we continuing? Is it occurring in our life? Are we doing this on a regular, consistent basis? Are you dedicated? Are you tenacious in your praying? Some of you have prayed for someone for a long time and you've given up. No, no. Bring it back. It's a lost person that you know. It's a neighbor. It's a son. It's a daughter. You're not praying as much as you used to. You got to get back to that. You got to be constant in prayer. That's the idea. I want to look at four ways that being constant in prayer in this section of Scripture helps us. Number one, if you want to write this down, uh, being constant in prayer will help to reveal that our Christian faith or our Christian life is genuine. That it's genuine. Now, in verse 9, notice what Paul says here. He says, let love be what? What's the word? Sincere is good. 
I also have a different word there, but it means the same thing, genuine. Let love be genuine. The love of Christ has been shed abroad in our heart. You have the love of God already inside. You just got to let it. But here's the thing. True Christians are going to let it. That's where Paul goes. In other words, that love of Christ inside of you, you're going to say, you know what, Jesus? I want you to shed your love to me, to other people. But you're going to see something very interesting here that it's directed in certain ways. The first way it's directed is to yourself. It reveals that your Christian life is genuine when you are constantly in prayer. Now, verse 9 is an interesting verse. I'm going to back up a little bit to chapter, the beginning of chapter 12 because it's a major transition. And Paul does this. He, he does this often in his letters. He goes from doctrine to duty. He does precepts, then the principle. What he'll do is he'll lay out the content, and then he'll want us to get to our conduct. So the first 11 chapters of Romans is all about that. He's laying out the gospel. He's laying out the gospel. Then he gets to chapter 12, and he says, okay, since you received the gospel, now here's how you live the gospel. He writes all of his epistles like that. Very important for a distinction, and I just wanted to bring it up. You got to have content, yes, but you can't keep content alone. It needs to transform your conduct, is what Paul says. Now, on the screen here, for those who can see it, we'll try to make it go higher every week. We keep raising it to try to make sure everybody sees it. Uh, can you bring up that next one, please? Here's some books. Now, you got Exercising, Health and Fitness, Sport, Gym, and Healthy Lifestyle. That's a lot of content. Uh, I, can, I can have these books, hold them underneath my arm. I can even read them. You can, too. You can have them in your library. If I come over to your house and I see your bookshelf and you say, wow, okay, cool, Health and Fitness, Exercise, Gym, Healthy Lifestyle. That's all great content. What happens if you never actually went to the gym? What happens if you never got on a piece of exercise equipment? Or you never got down to the beach and walked? You have the content. You have, you have the first 11 chapters of Romans, Paul saying. I'm giving it to you. You got the content. But, whoa, you can't stop there. You got to apply that to your life. It's the same principle. Jesus gives us a truth. Paul's giving it right here, but the Holy Spirit is empowering him. And then he says, he gets to chapter 12, and he goes, here's the transition. I've given this to you. I've given you all of the content you need. Now it's your conduct that needs to change and keep changing. Apply it. you got to keep applying it. So be constant. It'll be the gospel. It'll be salvation. That's where he goes. And then it'll be sanctification. And you got to have both of them operating. I'm just concerned that some people, they, they think they have salvation, but they don't have sanctification. That can't happen. It can't happen. You can't say that you're saved, and then your lifestyle isn't changing or getting more Christ-like or more godly or more humble or more holy. And so Paul talks about that in most of his letters. Let me go back a little bit with you and, and get some foundation as we move forward through this text. The Roman culture that these Christians were saved out of was tough. It was tough to be a believer. You think it's tough in our culture? I'm telling you, it's a thousand times harder. And the corruption and, and, the, and the sin pervasive and in, in, in through everything is just, it was bad. But he says this in chapter 1, Paul, in verse 16, that the gospel is the power of God for salvation. Why does he say that? This is chapter 1, verse 16. It's the power of God for salvation. Now, you can remember these people got born again out of Roman culture, out of a society that was evil. And in their mind, they're thinking, Rome and the empire is just so powerful. And how am I now supposed to live as a Christian in the middle of all of this? Put yourself in the, the recipients of this letter. This is, what, how you, this is how you try to understand the context. This is hard. So Paul says, listen, no, 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 no. It's not the Caesars. It's not the Roman Empire that is the most powerful because they believe that. Now it's Jesus Christ and the gospel that's more powerful than Rome. That would cause them to go, oh, okay, all right. That means the power of God is on my life, in my life, so that I can live a sanctified life that I can be different. You see, all of this is helping them to realize that their Christianity is genuine. If they're constant in prayer, it's going to reveal that they truly know Jesus Christ. And that's going to give them reassurance. They need that. All of us need that. 
So this is the flow of where Paul's going with this. So that's the first 11 chapters of Romans. When he gets to chapter 12, he makes an appeal, verse 1. He goes, I appeal to you, therefore. And there's that transitional sentence. That's a key sentence, a key phrase. He says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, why does he have to say that? Because they were presenting their bodies to sin. This was their life. They would present their bodies to all kinds of, of wickedness. And so now Paul is saying, no, you don't have to do that anymore. I want you to present your body as a living sacrifice. Not dead. They, weren't, they were killing things in, in the Roman culture, killing things, offering them as sacrifices. But now you're going to present yourself, but you're going to be a sacrifice that's alive. It's a whole different way of looking at life for them and for us. That's why he says, and he goes on, do not be conformed to this world. Do not be conformed to this world. I've read that a thousand times in the years I've been a Christian, and I think world like I live world. I've got to think world as they lived world. And I'm like, oh, man, yeah, that would have been tough. But there's hope for them, and there's hope for me. So Paul wants them to see salvation, now sanctification from chapter 12 onward, that it should affect how they live. Now watch this. In relation to, their, to God, to one another, these are different categories we're going to see real quick here. Their, their neighbors, people in general, and then even their enemies. There will be evidence of this change. Now, verse 9 again, let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. I just want to focus in on that word genuine or sincere. Now, how does this have anything to do with praying constantly? The constancy of praying. Well, praying is the evidence. It's evidence of our Christian confession. When I'm, I'm this kind of a person, I'm praying uh, praying sustains and equips the Christian. It's, it's a mechanism that's built in, that God has built into our life to keep us going. In other words, if you're going through the dark night of the soul and you're going through some really tough times, maybe that word was for you, you're, you're weary in the waiting. Listen, if you're praying constantly, that's a mechanism. That is something built into you by God and his gospel to help you to keep persevering. This is where Paul's going. So when you stop praying, you're cutting off. You're cutting off the, that, that power, that enablement, that presence of God. You can't do that and expect to survive. It's like the oxygen that we breathe. I need oxygen, right? Do you need oxygen? The older we get, it seems like we need more. You know, I need oxygen. I can't breathe as good. And so our souls need oxygen. Our Christian life needs oxygen, and that's praying. When you don't have oxygen, what happens to you? You die. When you don't pray, what happens to you spiritually? You die. That's just the way God built it. So do you know this kind of praying? And I'm not talking about having a prayer list, and I'm not against prayer lists. I don't keep a prayer list. I'm just not a list guy. Some people are list people. Are you a list person? They've carried a list all their life, a prayer list. And I'm like, wow, I'm kind of jealous. You know, I'm kind of envious over that. Wow, you can do that. I can't do that. But listen, be careful of just having a list. Be careful of being the person that just checks it off the list. That's your prayer life. Okay, I got that person, got that one, got that one, got that one. Some prayer meetings are like this. You go to a prayer meeting, and they have all these things that they hand out to everybody, and it's a prayer list. There's going to be our prayer list. Paul's not talking like that. Not that kind of praying. He's talking about praying that is just so free it's me and Jesus. It's a relationship. There's sensitivity. There's this, this thing going on between me and the Lord of glory. But if you're locked into this kind of rote thing, or I hear some people praying, man, they're praying some really big words. I don't even know what those words are. And God is the thou and the this, and I'm just like, oh, well. But I wonder about that. I don't judge. I'm not judging. But the Bible says that some people want to be heard for their many words. That's not the kind of praying that we're supposed to be doing. It's sincere prayer. 
It's not so that you look at me and you go, wow, he can really pray. It has to be real. It has to be, oh, Jesus, I need you. Are you not with me? God, I believe you to be true, but I'm struggling with doubt. I mean, this is how we should pray. It's a relationship. It's real. There's a difference. Jesus said this, Luke 18, 1. Men ought always to pray and not faint or lose heart. When you pray like this, it reveals and reassures you that you're the real deal. That's what it's meant to do. Number two, to recognize the church of Christ. So we're praying constantly. Now, here's the second category of people that Paul uh, addresses here. It's the church, verse 10 to 13. Paul shifts gears. Now he's talking about the church family and how Christians are to treat one another. And there's like 20 maxims here. I mean, it's just short, pithy statements. He just fires these things off, one after another after another, and how we should treat each other and how we should live in the church of Jesus. Why? Because we need to be recognizable how we treat each other, how we love each other, how we do life with each other. The prayer is to be here for those inside of this fellowship, this relationship context called the church, so that those on the outside would recognize that there's a difference. The world is watching. Do you know, I think the world watches the church and they don't see the church the way it was meant to be. And Paul's saying, this, this, this is, you've been transformed by the gospel. Jesus has come into your life and it should do something to you. And it should cause us to love each other. There should be fellowship. There should be unity amongst the brothers and sisters to recognize us. Now watch this. This is what Paul does. He talks about a familial love. Look at verse 10. A familial love. He calls it brotherly affection. Do you see that? In the SV. Brotherly affection. He goes down this list of maxims. I'm just going to highlight some of them. He says, showing honor, appreciation for people. Do you appreciate one another? Do you say that to each other? Did you say that to somebody coming in today? I appreciate you. How about, how about showing admiration for people? That's what that word means, showing honor. I think he says outdo one another. Does it say that? Man, if you want to have any kind of competition with some other Christian, outdo them and show an honor. I'm going to appreciate you more than me. No, I'm going to appreciate you more than me. And you're kind of going back and forth, back and forth. That's what you want to do. I just can't stand the competition that's amongst Christians where it's out of jealousy and envy and threat because that's everywhere. That's in the fellowship. It's in this church in some way. It's in every church. But outdo each other in showing honor to one another, he says. He goes on, he says, uh, not be slothful. I'm just going to highlight again. Uh, enthusiasm. Yeah, uh, be fervent in spirit. Care for one another. Focus on the return and, and, and redemption that we have in Jesus. Verse 12 says, rejoicing in hope. Notice, patient in tribulation. You're gonna be able to persevere only when you have hope. And the only way to have hope is to be praying constantly. He's tying everything together. It's a, it's a kind of a blanket over all four of these categories or these groups of people that we're looking at. First yourself, now the church. Genuineness, it's revealed. It recognizes the church. Let me look at verse 13 with you, notice. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. This is how we treat each other. Why? Because the world is watching. Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit. He talks about the gifts of the Spirit. All of those things should be operating in this church so that Jesus can be seen. People without Christ, they're watching. They're watching. Well, anyway, Paul's goal here is to say to the Roman Christians, the gospel have great impact through the church, through you, through the community of the saints, the way we love each other, the way we live among each other. Do you know that the church is becoming invisible to the world? I know that to be true. 
If we're not living by the Spirit, if we're not living supernaturally, Paul is saying, that the world will not recognize us. And so I really believe that some churches, oh, it's terrifying. They're unrecognizable. You look at them and you're like, what? People are watching. They're, they're, no, I don't see it. I don't see it. Are we recognizable as a church? Let me be honest with you and ask some tough questions. Does York see true Christianity in this church? The way we live. Number three, not just to reveal, to recognize, but to repair or break in fellowship. Verse 14 to 16. Constant praying helps to repair a break in fellowship. Again, the focus shifts again to this, uh, this third group of people. They're the people that we know just in a general way. Maybe a neighbor, maybe a friend, maybe a coworker. Uh, it could include a relative, maybe a distant relative, but it's this other grouping. It's a general category of people that we're in contact with. How do we relate to them? Praying for them too, for this relationship as well. Uh, this could be a Christian or a non-Christian. And so Paul takes three verses to speak to this. He says in verse 14, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. That's not talking about our enemy. That's talking about somebody that you know that has then turned on you. Uh, it could be a form of persecution, I would imagine, but that's not really where Paul's going with that one particular thought. He will do that in a moment. But this is the person that you're in relationship with. Maybe you thought they were a friend. Now they're not your friend anymore because they've done something against you. There's a break in that fellowship. What are you supposed to do? He says there, bless them. You're saying, no, 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 no. Well, it's possible because you have the gospel in you. Remember, Paul's saying this. You've been transformed. The first 11 chapters. So you have the power of God on your life to do the impossible. And that would be to bring that fellowship back together it may seem impossible initially. I get that. I had, a, had somebody in my world many, many years ago, it's 20 plus years ago now, that slandered us so bad that at least I went through the, one of the dark night of the souls. It was so, so hard that even today there's residual effect. Have you ever been in the darkness that far that 20 years later you're still twitching out sometimes and you're still feeling it? It was bad. And so this particular person did that against us and me in particularly. There was a break in the fellowship, and we had done ministry a long time together. We'd seen hundreds of people, hundreds. Ministry was thriving together. We did this. I mean, God did it through us, but we were in that relationship together, and then all of a sudden, there was a break. And the Lord said to me one day, and I was working through a book called Crazy Love by Francis Chan, and the Lord said, I want you to go to him. I said, go to him. I'm not going to him. He needs to come to me. That's what I said. He's the one that did this to me. I got to go to him. And the Lord said, yeah, you need to go to him. And I thought to myself, that's impossible. The depth of pain that he has caused my wife and I. But you know what I found? That God gives the strength. It's supernatural. He'll carry you through that. He'll give you words to share. And that's what God did for me. And It was amazing. Don't think it's impossible. Bless them. Bless them. Verse 15, be happy when others have good things happen to them. Are you genuinely happy when other people prosper? Can I just tell you when our life was tanking during that same time, I would look at other people, they got a new car, they got a nice house. I didn't have any of that. We didn't have any of that. And so we were losing everything, but other people were gaining. Even this person that was against us and hurt us, his life was moving forward. Our life is moving backwards. That's a tough place to be. I couldn't rejoice in that. It was hard for me. I, I was jealous. I was envious. I was bitter. I was mad. I was trying to work through all of that. Listen, rejoice with those who rejoice. Don't look at the person next door to you and they have a brand new camper and you're just like. Mm. It happens in our heart. Come on. You know, if somebody's better looking than you, you weren't meant to be good looking, I guess. I don't know. No, I'm just saying. Not everybody looks the same, but I don't mean that to be funny. It's just some people are more athletic. Some people are just more handsome, more pretty. Uh, some people are smarter. They're, they have more of an intellect than others. Don't compare yourself, and don't be envious of them because that will break the fellowship. Something will happen in the church. 
because of those kinds of things. Just be careful of that. This is what he's saying here. This is how he says, verse 16, live in harmony with one another. In other words, watch out for arrogance. He moves on. He says humility. He talks about this relationship breakage and try humbling yourself and seeing, seeing that God seeing that God will move mightily as a result. He says, never be wise in your own sight, he says. I'm just reading out of the text. The, the point is, you're constant in praying for this. Pray for repair. What relationship in your life needs repair right now? What needs repair? So let me just reiterate. Paul is talking about constancy in pray, praying in our relationship with God to those in the church, to those people in general. And let me just say it again, we cannot stop praying. Number four, finally, constant prayer will help to reach people who are against us. These are our enemies, chapter chapter 12, verse 17 to 21. Now, this is the fourth category of people, our enemy. These are against the gospel. They're against Christ and you. And Paul outlines our behavior towards them here. Now, keep in mind, the Christian, the Christian living in Rome at the time. I got an image here. It's, it's a picture of the Colosseum. Maybe you've seen it, right? Uh, you, you've probably seen this not as a participant, but as a tour guide. Now, if you lived in the days of Paul when he wrote Rome, the book of Romans, he would have approached that building, and it's a completely different thing going on inside of there, Right? You don't have people with their their, their camera around their neck, you know, and they're the tour guide walking through the Colosseum. You had people being filed in there to be fed to lions, Christians. Or you had gladiator games where they're killing each other. This is the world that Paul's writing to. They were enemies, enemies of Christ. This government that was over Rome hated the movement called the way. They were threatened by it. That kind of thing is happening around the world in other places, but it's going to happen more here. It's going to happen more and more. He says in verse 17, Paul, repay no one evil for evil. Is that what it says right there? People are going to do evil against you. Don't repay them with that similarly evil. You don't want to do that. Oh, but you'll feel like it. Won't you feel like it? I did. You leave me alone up here? You've never felt like retaliation or revenge or... Seriously, you'll feel like that. You'll, you'll want to go up against them. You'll want to wreck their reputation. You're going to want to hurt them somehow, even physically. My wife said one night, I'm going to get a baseball bat. Where's your baseball bat? I'm going... I said, whoa, 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 whoa. We got to slow down here. And here's why I say that is because... Many months before that, the Holy Spirit said to me, and this is how God is providential. He knows. He's sovereign over. He knows exactly. He's omniscient. He knows everything that's going on in our life, what's going to happen. And he said to me, I was doing my devotion. He said, be an example. I, this is almost audible. I know some of you might have a problem with the audible voice of God. But it happened. I was stunned, shaking, screaming out to Lisa. I think I heard God. God spoke to me. And he said, be an example and don't speak until the Holy Spirit gives you something. I didn't know what that meant. But an enemy would come against me months, months later. And she wants to pick up a baseball bat and go after him. And we said, babes, be an example. And don't speak until the Holy Spirit gives you something. And that pulled us back and it saved us from doing that. And we just trusted the Lord with vindication, with all of those things. How did we do that? It's not because we're mature. It wasn't because we're super Christians. It's because the gospel is in you. It's in us. That gospel will work in any situation with any enemy that you might have. But you have to be open to that. It goes on. I'm going to finish here. Verse 18. Notice verse 18. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, what do you do? You feed him. If he's thirsty, you give him something to drink. 
For so doing, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Here's what I did with that one person. I had a book, and it just blessed me. And I said, I'm going to give this to my enemy. That's risky. But I, I sense God was saying, give this book to him. So I went over to his house. Just thinking back 20 years later, I'm just like, wow, that was crazy. But it had to be God. And I said to him, I said, I, want, I just felt like the Lord led me over here to give you this book. It was on pastoral ministry. And I remember the days and the years that we did ministry together. And the Lord said, do that. How does that happen? It's not because I'm mature. I wasn't a super Christian. It was the power of God. Just be open to that. That's what Paul's saying. Our enemies, they'll come against us. It'll be hard. Don't repay evil for evil. We got to be a praying people. That's the point. Constant in prayer. In all four categories of these people, these relationships, be continuously praying. Never stop. We have something here that we call the war room. Uh, it's located over there uh, on the other side of the hallway. And uh, we're looking to build platoons. And these are people that are going to pray during the service. That's hardcore. I know it's a risk. Most people are like, I don't want to miss the service. I don't want to miss the service. I've heard that for 30 years. I'm just going to encourage you. We need people to pray during the service, for people to get born again, for the power of God to fall, for ministries, for new people that are coming to meet Jesus. That's called our war room. The war room. It's over there. There's a sign-up sheet on the back table there. I'm going to encourage you. Now, you're not praying there every week. We're going to have a schedule, so you'll probably be in the war room if you decide to join the, 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 the prayer ministry probably every other month, one time every other month. So it's not like a major commitment, but it would be nice to have the war room filled every single Sunday with five or six people. Would you join the war room? Would you, would you pray? You're saying, oh, what do I do? Do I got to pray out loud? Maybe. Maybe not. But just get in there and pray for the church. Pray for me. Pray for the worship. Pray for the presence of God. Sign up in the back, would you? I'll close with an illustration because some of you are, are um, maybe going through some difficulty and uh, a tough time. It reminds me of me and my dad. And it's just anything with a parent. When you're a child, uh, I remember being like this. Maybe you remember this too. When you're a child and you're in the dark, do you remember being in the dark, in a dark space? Uh, maybe outside, maybe inside. And you're with your dad or mom. What does a young child happen what do they do when it's dark and they're maybe holding the hand of their mom or dad? What do they do? This is a test. They talk more. You ever notice that? I used to do that. What is the child doing as they're talking more and more in the dark? What are they, what are they really saying? Daddy, I just want to know you're there. That's what a child would do. Mommy, I just want to know you're there. Constant in prayer. You're a child, and I'm a child, and God's our Heavenly Father. And the more we talk in the darkness and the difficulty and the suffering, the more you know that God is with you. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. Thank you for the Apostle Paul, who is filled with the Holy Spirit. And so, God, we thank you for the power of the gospel. We thank you for changing our lives. Now we're going we're gonna to pray constantly, continuously for all of these relationships our relationship with you, with the church, with people in general, and with our enemy. In Jesus' name, amen. We have John LaMontagne come up, and we're going to take communion together. <laughs>